So we're going to talk about Libra today. And I'm all about the symbolism. If you're unaware, my project is called Symbolic Studies. Symbolicstudies.com is where you can find all of my stuff. And unlike Robert and some other people here, um, I really focus on the symbolic depth of each sign. And, you know, years ago, I really got interested in symbology um, through my art and commercial artwork that I do for a living. So if you guys want to go to actually the first slide here, um, graphic design is my passion, right? And so um, it's what I've been doing for a long time, since I was a teenager. I've been you know, in Photoshop and Illustrator and all of the Adobe products, designing logos for people. And I've done album artwork and I've done uh, packaging and all sorts of stuff for uh, various clients, big and small. And as I really got into design, I started becoming more curious about the symbols that I was working with and the colors that I was working with and, you know, just working with clip art and different images and stuff. I've always been very visual. And so it would kind of be a natural thing for me to want to get into symbolism, I would say. Um, so starting in 2008, maybe 2006 or seven, is when I started buying symbolic reference books. And now I really know the lay of the land of what's out there, the different authors and what they talk about, their perspectives and whatnot. And that basically became a thing for me, is collecting these reference books and um, diving into the material and just having a deeper awareness of what basic shapes even mean. So the square, what does the square symbolically mean versus the circle, versus the triangle, things like that. And so along the way, you guys can go to the next slide, I got very interested in conspiratorial topics uh, and fringe topics and things like that. So design work, symbolism, kind of um, conspiratorial work. Uh, it was all stuff that I started absorbing, you know, um, through my 20s. And if you guys want to progress to the next slide. One of the things, though, that really blew my mind was starting to learn the tarot. And I learned it through a client of mine. He wanted me to design him a tarot website. And he said, if you're going to design a tarot website, then you should probably know something about the system. I knew nothing about the system at all. Naively, I thought I understood symbolism back then. <laughs> uh, because I went to film school and I was writing uh, scripts and we were decoding uh, scripts and movies and things like that. And I had already been doing design work for a long time. And he purchased like two dozen tarot books and he let me borrow a few. And I just picked them at random. And the first book I opened made reference to this deck here, which is the Alistair Crowley Thoth deck. And when I started reading about what the pentacles meant, what the cups meant, how they relate to all of these different metaphysical concepts and everything else, it was pretty much love at first sight. So I really dove into the tarot. From the tarot, I got really interested in astrology as well because you know, there's a correspondence with the cards, with the signs and other myths and color theory and numerology and all these other things. So the tarot is really what opened me up. And that is kind of a basis for me. Um, so the tarot completely opened me up. And um, from there, it just has been this kind of epic journey uh, with understanding the landscape of symbolism. And I've come to find out that a lot of modern symbologists, in my opinion, they're missing a few pieces to the puzzle. And so that's kind of the thing that I want to bring to the table is maybe some lesser known core fundamental things that will help your symbolic awareness with the signs and sort of everything else. Um, and so we can go to the next slide here. And so here we have uh, the astrological wheel. Today we'll be talking about Libra. Symbolically, what the scales represent. Uh, we'll be talking about the etymology of Libra itself. That's something else that I really am interested in is uh, wordplay and how there's a lot of things encoded in everyday words that we all use all the time. Um, and so you can really learn a lot just by decoding uh, a word there, right? And we can go to the next slide here and you'll see that there's really two sides to the zodiac. And 
This would be the light side up top between Aries and Virgo, and then oftentimes Libra through Pisces is considered the uh, dark side of the zodiac. And you'll see Libra is just on the other side of what's considered the light side or the day side of the zodiac. So in many ways, Libra, obviously being related to the equinox as well, brings us to the symbolic underworld. And I mentioned this yesterday, but Libra was a sign that took me a little while to really understand and wrap my head around. Um, I produce content based on each sign and I release it during the sign itself. And there are certain signs that I had an immediate sort of relationship with, I would say, um, that actually kind of became almost muse-like for me. Taurus was one of these signs where I just fell in love with everything related to Taurus and bull symbolism, cow symbolism, things like that. So that really came through very, very strongly for me early on. But Libra took several years for me to really kind of wrap my head around. And I mentioned this yesterday as well, but for whatever reason, I'm sure it's in my chart somewhere, <laughs> but uh, Libra season, I'm incredibly busy. I, I've noticed that. That's a pattern every single year, and this year is really no different. Um, and so Libra took a number of years to finally come into focus for me, but as I figured out through my personal sort of lens what it really means, it's completely blown me away. And so the depth of the scales, the depth of this sign, um, is pretty remarkable. I'm, I'm, it's kind of like awe-inspiring, to be honest with you, and I feel like I'm still digesting really um, the full breadth of what this sign is actually all about. But hopefully today, by the end of the presentation, you guys will have uh, you know, an awareness of where I've been at with my research. Right, yep, so here we are. These are the scales. And generally, the scales, when you see them in a lot of sky maps, you will see them illustrated similar to this, where there's a handle and then you have the two pans. Oftentimes you'll notice that the pans aren't even um, like weighing anything, they're empty. It's not uncommon too for the scales to be associated with the claws of the scorpion because Libra and Scorpio are right next to each other. So I've even seen it and I've put it in other presentations where the claws are actually resting in the pans of the scales, right? And so even the pans themselves have been referred to as the northern and southern claw. Um, this gets into a whole entire thing about Libra and Virgo and Scorpio being one large sign at one point and potentially Libra being introduced, which is very interesting because Libra also corresponds very, very closely with the sword. And so as we know, the sword cuts, the sword divides, the sword severs, right? So Libra seemingly perhaps was introduced dividing this huge, huge constellation into three smaller signs, uh, which we'll be getting into here in a little bit. But this is just a classic sort of depiction of the sign, and you'll see on the right-hand side there, um, there is Scorpio, right? And then of course, during Scorpio season two, it's like we have the Day of the Dead, we have Halloween, uh, the veil is thin, right? Uh, they say it's an opportune time to communicate with your ancestors and do that kind of work and everything else. So the underworld symbolism after Libra really, really comes through, um, through Scorpio and of course, a lot of the other signs. This is one of my favorite books um, when it comes to star lore and star mythology and things like that. I can't recommend it enough. It's Star Names, Their Lore and Meaning by Richard Allen. It was originally published in 1899. And he goes through so much brilliant information about every single constellation. And he goes through the mythology of individual stars and all the constellations as well. And one of the biggest things on why I love this book is because he gives you a lot of alternative names for every single sign, for every single constellation. And to me, when you're a symbologist, correspondences become a very, very big thing. Um, and so if we progress to the next slide here, we'll see just a few of the alternative names for Libra. I thought this was worth getting into. So we obviously have the scales. We have the scale beam. We have the way beam. Uh, there's different ways that it's been kind of conveyed, but essentially a weight, right? And so what does a scale do? Obviously, it weighs things against each other. What I've heard, too, is that the scales symbolically weigh uh, the grains that are harvested, like during Virgo. And so Virgo being the grain goddess, the harvest maiden, 
things like that, it kind of makes sense from a commerce perspective that uh, once you have your grains, that you would want them to be weighed accurately so that you can go to market and everything else and make sure you're getting paid, you know, what everything is worth. So I think that's kind of a curious sort of detail. All of the signs have like a very practical side to them. Um, and so a lot of times it's for farmers to know when to plant this or do this or, you know, what have you. Uh, I think a lot of that stuff is kind of, um, you know, it's kind of been lost to the sands of time, but to me, it's a really, really important thing to understand that there's like practical uses for uh, astrology and understanding the symbolism behind the signs. But you've got uh, the balance, the yoke of balance. That's very interesting. A yoke is what you put on like a draft animal, right? So like an ox or something like that. So they can pull a plow. That's something we'll be getting into a little bit here. The beam of balance, the celestial balance. To me, that's of particular interest um, because of just what it means and what it conveys and we'll be really unpacking that towards the end of the presentation the trays of balance here we go the claws this is a reference to scorpio the claws of the scorpion and then uh there you go yeah the claws of the scorpion there are some more titles on the next slide here the solar lamp the great lamp um, there's also some stuff that i've come across alluding libra to a great fire as well which makes sense with those two titles. The Lighthouse of Alexandria is another one. The Life Maker of Heaven. The Lofty Altar. That's another one that I think is really curious. Uh, Libra has things associated with it being an altar of some sort, and sometimes an altar with incense, or sometimes an altar with actually a fire burning on it. There's another constellation called Ara, A-R-A, -A, that has uh, some esoteric symbolism associated with Libra that I've read a few times as well. So my kind of approach is I like to digest all of it. I like to kind of put it all on, you know, some scaffolding in my mind or like a shelf. And then I kind of pull things out when I see other things kind of repeating the same sort of dynamic or, you know, when I feel like it's uh, worth diving into further, I'll, I'll check that out. But every single sign really truly is worthy of like a volume of, of books. There's so much information associated with each one. And years ago, I decided that if I'm going to be a worthy symbologist, I have to have a good astrological kind of uh, foundation with everything. So that is really the basis of my project. Um, so the sensor, as in like an incense sensor, Pluto's chariot, I think is really interesting as well, um, being related to the underworld and the journey to the underworld. And as we we're saying, going uh, into Libra season, you're going into the, into the night side of the Zodiac. Um, the Tower of Babel is fascinating too. And so the Tower of Babel, um, if you look at older illustrations, oftentimes it has seven stories to it. And we're dealing with the seventh sign here, right? Isn't that kind of curious? The sword, as I mentioned very briefly already, the sword is essentially synonymous with the scales. And this has to do with the sword's ability to divide. And so it'll take the one, it'll take the monad, and it'll split it into two. And now you actually have things to weigh against each other, right? And there's some symbolism that I've seen in tarot cards and elsewhere where the sword is essentially associated with the support of the scale, where the point of pivot is, that the tip of the blade is associated with that point of pivot of the scale. So sword symbolism, you'll be seeing that pop up throughout the presentation here. Also a potter's wheel. I thought that was interesting. I'm pretty sure that that reference comes from the East. And so um, the potter's wheel though, it all has to do with pivot. It has to do with spin. It has to do with a rotation around, um, you know, one point, one specific point, And that's how scales work. You know, you have to have that fulcrum. You have to have that point in the middle that balances uh, each pan. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um, the tarot card associated with Libra is the justice card. And so, um, you know, just thinking about justice and, and uh, lady justice and what that is all about, handing out judgments. I'm thinking of the law. To me, it's all in an effort to bring balance, right? To bring balance to society and things like that. And you can think of balance as like a teeter-totter and, and scales, or you can think of balance too, I would say, as something that's actually spinning, something that's in motion, almost like a ballerina, 
or something like that. This uh, idea of adjustment and kind of like this centrifugal force and kind of um, trying to stay centered and not be thrown off. So Libra, the LIB, there's a lot of words that start with LIB that I'm inclined to think actually um, have a relationship with Libra. So let's go through a few of them. As an example, library, even the first five letters of library spell out Libra, right? Um, there's a lot of things that I found having to do with Libra um, that correspond with books. And I think that this might have something to do, I think there's several different angles that this kind of like became to be, but one of them is that, um, you know, even the law, right? Uh, when someone is guilty, they say, throw the book at them, right? So this book of laws, right? That's in play for sure. Um, I also think of, like I said, sword. Sword is an anagram for words. And even sword literally has word right there in it, right? And so uh, the pen is mightier than the sword. Uh, your words can cut like swords, right? So there's a lot of symbolism that relates to communication and the sword. The sword in the tarot relates to air. And so air relates to communication, right? Um, all of the air signs have a glyph where it's like two separate lines. And so with Gemini, you got the two vertical lines. With Libra, you've got the upper line and then the lower line. With Aquarius, you got the two squiggly lines. What some people have said is that it's almost like these two lines are in communication with each other in a way. And uh, as I'm talking now, right, my words are flowing through the air, right? And I need my lungs to project so you guys can hear me and everything else. So air symbolism relates to um, the sword and relates to Libra as well. So I think that communication dynamic plays a part when it comes to uh, this library sort of concept. Um, and there's a bunch of other things going on there, including, too, the fact that Libra has this interesting relationship with ledgers and keeping ledgers, you know, and commerce and things like that. And so there's even a bookkeeping sort of dynamic that relates to Libra as well, I would say. Um, once again, going back to the li uh, library thing. To be held liable, right? Um, so there's some words in litigation that kind of relate to um, uh, Libra in that way. The next word I have here is uh, liberty, right? I think that relates to Libra as well um, in a few different ways. And what a lot of people don't understand, in the next slide you'll see it, but Libra Pondo was actually a, um, it was a, a unit of currency. And so in the Roman world, Libra Pondo, uh, this is actually where we get the abbreviation for pound for is, is uh, from Libra Pondo, from Libra. So LB is literally a reference to this right here. And so it's a whole entire history that you can look into. Um, but it seems like every step along the way, from what I can tell, especially more in the modern world, Libra has been associated with like numbers and currency and weights and measures and things like that. And this weights and measures business too also transcends like commerce and things, right? Uh, I'm thinking of like cosmic scales of justice. I'm thinking of myths where your soul is weighed against something else or your heart is weighed against a feather, right? Going back to the air symbolism thing. Yep, so there you go. So LB comes from Libra, Pondo. So let's talk about the glyph briefly. And so this is the glyph that I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with for Libra. I'm inclined to think essentially that uh, it represents a setting sun. And so the sun setting, the sun going to the underworld. So this is a common thing. Ancient peoples used to think that the sun went away to a very different place and then rose again the next day and that there was this perpetual battle between the sun and the moon, between solar and lunar forces. Um, so this to me is more than likely a setting sun. And even the word set is pretty interesting as well. Um, set and sat etymologically are related to each other. And Saturn is exalted in Libra. And there's a lot of symbolism with like, dissension or like a fall or kind of like this gravitational force that definitely corresponds with Saturn. And what do you know at the equinox here uh, that we just went through? We now have equal parts day and night because the sun is receding, right? It's going back um, to the opposing tropic. 
So there we go, the setting sun, as I mentioned. But there's another theory on what this glyph means that I think is kind of lesser known and lesser discussed, and that's actually the yoke. So again, the, the yoke of an ox or of a draft animal. So you can imagine if you just flip this around, if you invert it, that it kind of looks like the glyph for Libra. And there's evidence out there that um, this was a, an association that people kind of developed over time. And there's a little uh, kind of poem by Homer. That's the next slide that I'll read for you guys. So, but when Astraea's balance hung on high, betwixt the nights and days divides the sky, then yoke your oxen, sow your winter grain, till cold December comes with driving rain. And so I thought that was worth mentioning, but this idea of a yoke being associated with the sign and here, or sorry, this is by Virgil, um, that there is a, a relationship there that has been developed this is interesting, too, because Venus rules Libra, but Venus also rules Taurus, right? And so ox symbolism, this draft animal sort of concept, more yoke symbolism kind of is coming through um, with this Venusian association. And then I think before I get into some of the lesser known material, I think it's worth bringing up once again this dynamic between Virgo, Libra, and then Scorpio. Isn't it interesting that the glyphs of Virgo and the glyph of Scorpio, that they're on opposing sides of the scales, they kind of balance each other out. It's almost like, you know, this is very kind of, um, this is painting it with a very broad stroke, but it's almost like the uh, divine feminine on the day side with Virgo and what she represents with purity and all these things. Uh, balancing sort of the divine feminine, but on a sort of darker sort of level, right? With all things scorpionic. Um, and this idea, once again, that Libra perhaps was introduced and divided this large, large constellation into three smaller constellations. I think it's very interesting. Uh, there's variations on this theme as well that people have kind of written about over time. Um, perhaps, I believe, even just two of these constellations um, being represented and then one of them being divided by Libra. But it's all fascinating stuff. Okay, so let's get into some Venus symbolism and how that relates to the sign. So this is the glyph of Venus overlaid with the ten sephiroth of the Kabbalistic tree of life. And so I'm not sure how much... Um, you guys have gotten into the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. I like to learn all systems, and I like to just kind of see what's out there, and what people say about all sorts of, uh, of these systems. But when I came across this, I thought that this was really fascinating. That of all the planetary glyphs and constellation glyphs, that Venus is the only one that intersects with all of the ten Sephiroth on the Tree of Life. So. On the Tree of Life, there's three pillars. There's one central pillar that extends above uh, and below the other two side pillars. And so you can see that there's three columns, essentially. But one of the really, really intriguing things to me is there's a hidden Sephiroth um, called Doth. Some people say that Doth relates to death or that it actually corresponds with Thoth. Um, Thoth is known for being very, very mercurial. Um, and I feel like I just have to mention this too, but I think there's something to be said about Thoth or Mercury, Mercury being the true consort of Venus, potentially, and not Mars. I know it's really common to say men are from Mars, women are from Venus, um, but men might be from Mercury. <laughs> and so that's kind of my personal opinion. Uh, I, I put so much stock into mercurial symbolism, Mercury, the planet, associated deities and myths and gods. There's a reason why a lot of magicians and wizards and mystics and sages have a reverence for Mercury. Um, I, could do, I could go on and on and on about Mercury. But all you have to do is just add horns to the glyph of Venus, and now you have the glyph for Mercury, right? And so isn't that kind of interesting? So there is a relationship to me between Venus and Mercury that I've picked up over time. 
So there you go, the 10 Sephiroth, uh, the 22 paths of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. These 22 paths uh, correspond with the 22 Hebrew letters. They also correspond with uh, 22 tarot cards, right? And so it's a whole entire system. And Doth right there is hidden. So you're actually not really seeing it. This is kind of a common theme uh, or a common thing you'll see if you get into this kind of material. What Doth is known for, it's known for being the gateway to the other side, symbolically. It's known for being the gateway to the night side of this system. So literally an inverse version of this system that's completely turned upside down. It's known for accessing the root side of the tree. What some people have said is that this tree has no roots and that that's kind of a problem. It does have roots. It does have a night side. It has a deeply, deeply feminine side to it, but you access it through that hidden Sephiroth. This is a whole entire thing. It's a deep, deep study with everything, but that hidden Sephiroth would be within the circle of the glyph of Venus. And so there you could see the three pillars highlighted. Oftentimes people say, this is a really common thing, is that the three pillars, or especially the two side pillars, the two side pillars correspond with lunar symbolism and solar symbolism. Now, what's to be made of this central pillar? This central pillar actually corresponds with what I refer to, and, and many others have referred to as well, with polar symbolism. So a lot of times people only discuss lunar symbolism, solar symbolism. There is a third thing here that is more primordial, that is more ancient, and it's best described as polar. And so we'll be getting into all of that. There you go, I'm just highlighting that hidden Sephiroth. So once again, the gateway to the other side, to the great beyond, um, this hidden Sephiroth corresponds with the north. This is something that you're gonna read about esoterically if you decide to get into it. And I think personally, a lot of symbolism comes from what could be referred to as a northern place, even the northern sky. So the northern sky to me has been a huge revelatory experience diving into it. I'll mention two examples real quick that um, kind of explain and help unpack what I'm referring to here. Uh, there's this guy named John Major Jenkins. He wrote a book called Galactic Alignment. He's pretty convinced that in ancient China, they had eight constellations in the northern sky, each one corresponding with a different trigram. There's 64 hexagrams that are made up of two different trigrams each. Um, and he says the ancient Chinese people had eight constellations in the northern sky and that that was their early primordial zodiac when they were in a polar tradition. When things became more solar over time, these constellations shifted over to the ecliptic, to the path of the sun, and then they added four more constellations, giving them 12 constellations. There are other authors who have said something very similar, that essentially the symbolism of our zodiac, of all of the signs on the path of the sun, originated in the northern sky. And so that there was a symbolic transference of constellations in the north that shifted over to the ecliptic. And so the gateway to the other side has been said to exist in the northern sky in a primordial context. And so I'm inclined to think that the northern sky is likely the, the true stairway to heaven, if you will. So once again, just highlighting that hidden Sephiroth here. Well, I think it's very interesting that there is a relationship with the support of the scale and the fulcrum, that point of pivot, with this central pillar. And so you can almost imagine that this central pillar is what people have referred to as the middle path or the middle way, right? Between solar and lunar. It's a different thing, it's a completely different element. It's polar, it's more primordial, it's more ancient. It transcends lunar and solar dynamics. And so personally, symbolically, what I see here with the scales is that you can't weigh anything. There is no system here without that central support. You can't do it. You, you need that central support 
So you can have a point of pivot, which is known as a fulcrum, so you can actually weigh things against each other. This to me is one of the like esoteric sort of elements of Libra that really started blowing my mind because essentially the equinoxes and the solstices, when you dive into the symbolism, what you find out is ancient peoples viewed them as poles, which pole symbolism is rela related to pillar symbolism and it's related to column symbolism. And so there's a whole thing that you can look into with the equinoxes and the solstices um, being basically columns, you know, essentially. And so I think Libra represents in many ways a central column and it's a symbolic central sign as well. It's the seventh sign. And so it divides the year, you're right. So the equal parts day and night. Isn't it interesting as well then that this card here, this is the justice card from the Rider Waite. This is the card that corresponds with Libra. And justice is sitting between two pillars, sitting between two columns. This is making justice the symbolic central pillar. He's the central column, right? He, he is the middle way, or she is the middle way, the middle path, right? In justice's hands, in the right hand, you have a sword. This is synonymous with that central pillar, right? This is synonymous with the scales based on my research. In the other hand, you actually have a pair of scales, right? And that sword is right in front of a pillar, those scales right in front of another pillar. They're linking symbolically these items with pillar symbolism, with column symbolism. Um, what I found is that a lot of people, especially in the West, if you start looking into symbolism, you're going to probably look into twin pillars before you even look into the single pillar. But if you want to know about twin pillar symbolism, the twin towers, you know, as an example, you have to look into the single pillar and what that represents in and of itself, right? And so justice, this is the, uh, this is the middle way, this is the middle path. You would want a judge to be of this essence, right? Impartial, you know, willing to see both sides of a situation or of a thing. So I thought that was very curious. It's also in this system, it's the 11th card, number 11. You got twin pillars once again. Whenever you see twin pillars anywhere, Gemini as well, right? There is an implied third pillar. There's an implied middle column. There's an implied middle way. Um, Mercury rules Gemini. And I see Mercury as being very much this middle path, middle way um, in, in so many different ways. But let's get into Venusian symbolism and what's going on with that. How many of you guys know what this is? Yeah, it's the, it's the cycle of Venus over eight years from the perspective of Earth. And so it's beautiful. And so it's been called the kiss of Venus. It's called uh, the Venus pentagram or the Venus rose sometimes. A lot of symbolism associated with the rose uh, has to do with the number five. It's not uncommon to see a rose with five petals on it, like the Tudor rose. Um, but this is amazing to me for so many different reasons. Because when you look into Venusian symbolism and you look into the cards that it's associated with, the number five really, really pops out. And the number five is extraordinarily deep. Venus even starts with a V, which is Roman numeral five, right? It corresponds with the Hierophant card, which is the fifth card in the Major Arcana. So it's relating back to the five again. But we'll look here at a couple of other, basically, um, you know, illustrations of the exact same dynamic. So just another way of looking at the same thing, basically. And then if we progress here, we'll see that that's essentially showing you the same thing, is the uh, Venusian connection to the pentagram or to the pentacle. Based on my research, I think a lot of times when you see a five-pointed star, you're actually looking at a Venusian reference. You're looking at a reference to Venus. And so this is why the pentacles in the tarot, as an example, the coin with a pentagram, pentacle on it, uh, being associated with the earth is as such. is because it's a Venusian reference. To me, there's like a Mother Earth 
sort of Gaia kind of dynamic with that. Um, the ratio of what you see here of this line being highlighted is known as the golden ratio. And so this ratio from what you see up here and what you see down below, uh, this is known as the Fibonacci sequence as well, basically. And what I found on like a sacred geometry level is that the five really exists, the pentacle really exists between the physical and the spiritual realm. In, in and of itself, the pentacle is a bridge. It's a bridge between this domain and more etheric planes. Based on my research, that's what I've come to find out. Um, all of the symbolism suggests this. All of the mathematics suggests this. It's a, a deeply spiritual thing to kind of understand um, what this actually means and entails. One of the things, as an example too, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fifth element, it's ether, spirit, right? And so we obviously have five fingers, five man appendages, things like that. I see it in the tarot that the five also represents this bridge between higher and lower. Um, in that we use a base 10 numbering sequence here uh, in the West. So one through 10, the five is right there in the middle. Uh, the five kind of represents a threshold between these different domains. And so I see that the five in the tarot, oftentimes like the five of swords, the five of pentacles, the five of cups, like it represents some sort of challenge. But as we know, challenges is, are actually how we grow, right? It's how we become... Um, you know, better individuals. It's, it's how we see what we're really made of, right? And so there's always a growth opportunity with ailments and, and challenges and hiccups and things like that, as you mentioned yesterday or this morning, you know, with the different things that we all have to face, right? Um, so what you see here is a five-pointed star on the top of a Freemasonic lodge in London and so while I see the five-pointed star as being very Venusian um, in many, many different ways, it's also been used to indicate other stars as well. And so this lodge, as an example, openly, I was very surprised. I had my hunch. I feel like I know what it understands from my research. They openly acknowledge that this is the North Star. They say that this is Polaris. And what do you see there? Hopefully you can see it. A ladder going to the North Star. This is the symbolic stairway to heaven that I'm referring to. And then what do you see around? You actually see the zodiac. You see the different signs of the zodiac. It's not uncommon for illustrations, if they're showing this stairway to heaven or this ladder to heaven, to actually have seven rungs on the ladder, which I think is really, really interesting. Um, Libra being the seventh sign, right? And what about the uh, scales? Oh, boom, there you go. I didn't even notice that. No, that's brilliant, man. Exactly. That's, that's totally what it looks like, man. Yeah. So that would be the middle path, the middle way. This would be the two scales on, on the left and the right. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Because I've seen this for like years and I've never picked that up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. So this in ancient Egypt was the glyph or the symbol for the duat, specifically the gateway to the duat, which is the other side of existence, right? So this to me has been expressed in so many different ways. Some occultists have said that this is universe A and there's universe B. Uh, this is the physical realm. There's a spiritual realm. My personal opinion, if I'm being honest with you, I think when you're looking at the night sky, you're looking at the spirit realm. I don't think you're looking at a physical realm. I don't think you can actually go to the stars. I don't think you can actually go to these different planets. I think you're looking at something that's purely spiritual. We're just interpreting it um, sort of in a different way based on our modern conditioning and, and things like that. But this symbol was the opening to the other side for them. And it's a five-pointed star. Of all the things it could be, it's a five-pointed star, right? So this is the Hierophant card. You can see here it corresponds with Taurus, and you see all of these five-pointed stars when you look closely at it. And they're all emanating from this woman right here, 
who is essentially an expression of ISIS. And I see ISIS, I'm more of a, uh, I see more similarities than differences. And so I see this as essentially an expression of Venus as well. You know, some people might have issues with that or whatever. I don't really see that. I think when you're looking at the various goddesses, I think you're seeing different expressions of the same goddess. You know, the same way we're all just different expressions of the same god, in, in my opinion, right? Um, but maybe go back to that card just for a second. And so she is holding a sword, right? And so we're talking about sword symbolism as it relates to Libra, as it relates to the middle path, right? She's also holding a crescent moon right there. Briefly, we talked about it yesterday, but uh, there's something to be said potentially about lunar symbolism actually uh, coming from a Venusian origin and that Venus having sort of this um, core resonance that got shifted over to the moon at some point. I've also heard, if I'm not mistaken, Venus goes through its own cycles, right? And so um, some people have said that even the crescent moon symbolically represents Venus going through different cycles, not necessarily uh, the moon. Right, so Libra, the seventh sign, right? So let's talk about the seven and how the seven corresponds with Libra and how absolutely epic the number seven is just in all of its expressions. I, I kind of like to say that we almost live in a reality that relates to the number seven. Like the number seven is like the number of this domain in so many different ways, right? So as an example, you have this idea, and this is something that I've seen all over the place, that there are seven veils to the great beyond, that there's seven tiers, seven layers, seven stories between where we live and the next plane. This relates to all sorts of different things, but you can see here very clearly that there is a little ladder going to this next plane and then all the way up to sort of uh, the afterlife, basically. You know, which I would say too, I correspond that with the underworld as well. Um, but seven different layers, if I'm not mistaken, this is uh, a Middle Eastern illustration. Sometimes in Islam, it's expressed as 70,000 veils, but you see that the number seven is still there in the mix, right? This is that Tower of Babel that I was referring to, seven different layers. Uh, symbolically, I tend to pay more attention to uh, the seven traditional planets. Um, and so that tends to be my sort of framework with things. But you have the seven traditional planets. They've been associated with these seven layers, these seven steps, uh, these seven different stories. And what is a tower, too? A tower, you're getting closer to God as you ascend, right? You're getting closer to the heavens. The story of the Tower of Babel is that they wanted to storm the gates of heaven. Uh, Babylon being the first civilization post-flood, they built this tower in unison with each other. They spent many, many years, this is the mythology, that they spent all of these different, um, or many years, many cycles, coming together, building this tower, hoping to get closer to God. God thwarted that plan, struck it down, that's essentially what you see in the Tower card. You're seeing the destruction of the Tower of Babel, basically. And then after that, everyone was separate. Everyone had a different language. They were speaking Babel to each other, right? And so God introduced all of these new languages, so everyone had to kind of spread out and do their own thing. So I think that this symbolism is extraordinarily deep, too. There's like a million things you could talk about with it. But William Olcott, in a book that I'm going to be plugging in a second, he says under his Libra entry, there is little doubt that in very early times, the ancients saw in these stars, the stars of Libra, an altar towering to the heavens. So the tower is also synonymous with Libra as well because it is that middle path. It's that middle column, right? Pillar symbolism, tree symbolism, mountain symbolism, it goes back to what's called the world axis or the axis mundi. And this is the idea that these things span and bridge the gap between all that is above and all that is below. That um, all layers above us and below us are actually connected 
via an axis, via a central column in the house of God. And it's through this central axis that you can actually astral travel to the different realms. This is why going to your center is how you actually astral travel. There's a whole entire dynamic with this. There's a lot of Eastern thought baked into all of this stuff. But I'm inclined to think that when you access the center of self, you can actually access the center of the cosmos. That, that's the metaphysical thing that I've wrapped my head around. Um, and so, Star Lore by William Olcott. Uh, that was another book that I wanted to plug. It's the slide right before this one. Star Lore, Myths, Legends, and Facts. Uh, those two books, if you get the other book by Richard Allen and you get this book and you want to dive into a sign and really understand the mythology behind it, those are the ones to get in my opinion. They're readily available. They were published a little while ago, so I try and find older references. So they were referencing older material, obviously, and they just pull together a ton of excellent information. All right. There's also alchemical processes that make use of the number seven as well. So this is something called, I mean, it's, it's from a, a system called Azoth Alchemy. And their whole entire thing is that there are seven steps to really transmute something. And you can see that each of these seven steps has a different word associated with it, a different Latin word. This actually makes a, uh, a sentence and every single step corresponds with a different planet as well. And you can see that there's a Saturn right here down below. It's the only one painted black. Um, but like I said, I think the number seven is such a powerful spiritual number. Um, some people have said it's the number of perfection as well. And if we proceed to the next slide, I'll show you all of the other ways in which seven has kind of permeated this reality, right? There's seven days of creation, this idea of seven heavens, which is what I showed you guys earlier, the seven seas, the seven wonders of the world. There's all of these myths about seven sages uh, that come and bestow wisdom upon humanity. Uh, the Apkalu are one of them, and from the Vedic world, uh, they're known as the Rishis. Interestingly enough, these seven sages come from the northern sky. Um, there's seven hermetic principles. There's seven Mithraic degrees. This is the um, Mithraic mystery system. You have the idea of lucky seven or 777. Uh, in the Bible and in other places, there's mythology about seven hills or seven mounds. Um, you have seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven lamps. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And so to me, again, the relevance here is that Libra is the seventh sign. So from the very beginning of the astrological year to Libra, we're going through seven different cycles, right? On an etymological level, when you see sept, that's a reference to seven actually, right? And so September, September, uh, this is when Libra begins, right? In September. And so things have been thrown off because these emperors and stuff introduce like new months and you know, whatever. But September actually is a reference to the number seven. And so if I'm not mistaken, is September the seventh month after the astrological new year, right? And so you have that as well. And so again, the number seven, septenary, septenary, that is a reference to the number seven, just like with septagon, which is the next slide. And then now, to me, this is really the fun stuff. This is the stuff that really gets me off, if I'm being honest. Uh, the number seven itself, where did the number actually come from? Like, where did the glyph come from? After a lot of research and putting together the puzzle the way that makes sense to me, I think I have a pretty good idea of literally where that shape that we've all used a billion times in our life, where that actually comes from. And it actually comes from the relationship of Ursa Major with the North Star. And so Ursa Major is the Big Dipper. These stars uh, are incredible because, like I said, it seems as though a lot of primitive people, a lot of ancient people, their sky clock was in the northern sky. 
So there have been several sky clocks that different cultures have paid attention to. In this context, in this world, it's mostly based on the cycles of the sun and of the planets, right? The wandering stars. Uh, there's other cultures, though, where they have a lunar sky clock and they're paying attention to the moon. So in Islam and in Judaism, they're on a lunar cycle. You know, their holy days are based on the moon. I'm presenting here that a lot of people in the primordial tradition, they were looking at Ursa Major and Ursa Minor going around the Northern Star. That was their sky clock. And so that was of supreme importance to them. And so I think a lot of symbolism in the modern world actually goes back to that. I think that when you look at the roots of a lot of things, it actually goes back to this dynamic. And so this is a classic thing. This was important for seafarers and things like that. How do you find the North Star? The Big Dipper is pretty visible in the sky. And that's how you find the North Star. You look at the, uh, the vessel portion of the Dipper and you can basically make a clear line all the way to the pole star, right? So this is the star that um, you know gives you orientation, right? So if you know where the North Star is, you know where you're going in the seven seas, right? And a lot of cultures too could see the Dipper as well, the Dippers, because they're circumpolar constellations. So they are in the northern sky, meaning that they don't dip below the horizon. So obviously, if you're following astrology, all of the signs along the ecliptic, they go below the horizon and then they come back up, right? These stars, for a lot of people, they do not do that. So they're always there. They're always present. And the North Star in particular, depending on who you ask, it's always been stationary. It's always been there. Night after night after night, um, this is the guiding star, right? This relates to ideas that you know correspond with uh, your true north and everything else so when you look at that illustration here this is ursa major going around the pole star four times a year so once a quarter right and so this is where we get the swastika from if you look at eastern texts they're going to acknowledge that this is what the swastika is all about in the modern world especially in the west people have no understanding of this at all, right? And so a lot of times, if you look into the swastika, different symbologists will say that it's a solar symbol, but I'm here to say it's actually a polar symbol. And so it's going around the pole star, it's going around polaris, it's going around this central column, this point of pivot, right? And so there you go, the swastika. So does this not look like four sevens connected to each other, right? And so I believe that this is the origin of where uh, we get the shape of the number seven itself. And this is an old map. Actually, this is a uh, friend's library. He, ha he has a ton of amazing old books, sky maps and uh, books on mythology and things like that. And I was just looking at this map and I was reminded of the fact that if you look in older maps, the north is referred to as septentrio, okay? Sept, this goes back to the number seven, and it's actually a reference to the seven stars of Ursa Major. So Ursa Major has been referred to as the original seven stars of enlightenment, and going back to my symbolic shift dynamic, my symbolic transference uh, idea that I kind of touched on, um, it relates to that. And it relates to the idea that these original seven stars um, contain so much information that over time what happened when people became more solar and started paying attention more to the path of the sun, that the symbolism transferred over to other things. So some people even make the claim that uh, a lot of symbolism associated with the seven traditional planets actually goes back to the northern stars, pretty much. So septentrio equals the north. And what I've read, too, from some occultists, uh, and I think that this is true if you want to progress to the next slide there, that Sept actually is a reference to Set as well. So there is an Egyptian deity named Set, and he's known for being very chaotic, but kind of chaotic good. And so the idea, my understanding, is that you wanted to fight fire with fire. So if you believe that there was an adversarial figure that you wanted to have 
a deity or a god that was just as nasty as the god that you're trying to kind of combat or trying to uh, warn off or something like that. Set was that deity for ancient Egyptian people for, for a period of time. And Set has been said to hide behind Ursa Major. That's one of the things that's been said about him. Um, and so Set also, a lot of people have made the connection that Sat and Set and Sit are actually all related to each other. So once again, Saturn, right? Um, Saturn being exalted in Libra. To sit is to come down, right? So even just the, this idea of things setting, the sun set, right? So I, I even see the word sunset, and whenever I see the set part, I can't not think about all of this stuff, right? This journey to the underworld and, and things of that sort. So again, Saturn exalted in Libra. And we'll be getting into, uh, okay, before I do that, actually. No, you can, uh, there you go. So I did a presentation, I did a couple of them called The Lost Lore of Saturn. And I really get into Saturn being the ruling planet of the last golden age, which is a really, it's a pretty, it's just a, it's a fascinating thing for me to think about. Um, but Saturn having had a fall from grace, basically, especially in the modern world. Saturn being known for being black and, and lumbering and slow, associated with lead, being an old man, all these other things. I don't think that this was always the narrative with Saturn. Saturn, I think, um, has gone through a major, major change throughout its existence. And so if you wanna learn more about my personal perspective on Saturn, how it relates to the Golden Age, how it relates to the feminine, the divine feminine, the dark feminine, um, then you can watch that presentation if you're interested. But nowadays, Saturn is associated with uh, kind of this dark lord sort of concept. Set is also related to this dark lord sort of concept. This is a book by a guy named Peter Lavenda. I personally got a lot out of it. I thought it was very, very interesting. But this cover here is why I'm bringing it up, actually. Um, it took me a while to kind of see this, but if you go to the, well, there you go. You'll actually notice if you see the full sort of version of the cover, he actually shows all of the zodiac signs around this figure in the middle. So right here you see Aries, Taurus, Gemini, etc. And it goes all through the zodiac. And so opposite Aries would be Libra, right? So opposite Aries. You have Libra right there, and I noticed that Libra was actually being treated a little differently than all of the other signs. So if you want to go yeah, to the zoomed in version of that, you'll see that Libra has scales hanging from it. And then you'll see that there's actually a vortex right underneath Libra. And then I think it's kind of curious, it's hands as well. This is kind of a known, a lot of people like to say that this hand gesture is very Masonic. You know, there's a lot of things that people have decoded with that. Uh, but this is all resting on Saturn. And Saturn is in the lap of the Dark Lord. And so to me, I think there's a number of ways of interpreting this. But it really, excuse me, it really speaks to this underworld dissension. Um, going to uh, the afterlife, if you will. Going to the great beyond. The, a non-physical plane of reality, basically. A lot of people who get into symbolism will come across the idea that the cube is related to Saturn. And so there's a lot of black cubes like all over the world, in New York City and everywhere else, right? And so the black cube has been an occult symbol for uh, a good while. And when you break down cube symbolism, what I found is that it represents so many different things, but it represents space. That's one of the things it represents. Um, because there is an up, a down, left, right, forward, and backwards. So it actually represents the six directions, pretty much. But one of the sort of keys in understanding its true, true power, and this is the case with all stars, this is the case with all um, polygons as well, that there is always a hidden relationship with the central point of any star or of any shape. So in this example, there is a sacred center to the cube, right in the middle of the cube, 
And this would actually be the seventh point, right? So again, going back to the number seven again. Um, in Islam, you're going to see the black cube, right? And so the whole thing with uh, the Kaaba cube is that everyone in the world who is Muslim prays towards the Kaaba, which sounds like cube, kind of, right? They pray towards the Kaaba five times a day. And there's a lot of five symbolism in Islam too. There's like five pillars of Islam as an example. And one of your duties as a Muslim is to visit this Kaaba cube, right? At least once in your life. And so what happens when people go to the Kaaba? They go there and you go around the Kaaba cube seven times. There's the number seven again, right? And so you circumambulate. These are called circumambulation rituals. You go around the Kaaba cube seven times. They are mirroring what's happening in the northern sky. That, that's where this comes from, is that they are representing the Kaaba cube as the point of pivot in the heavens, and they're going around it seven times, and they're going counterclockwise. That's really important. When you get into circumambulation rituals, because they're all over the place, the maypole, is an example of a circumambulation ritual. Um, there's a lot of folk rituals that represent you going around like a tree or a mountain or something along these lines. In Freemasonry, there's, uh, there's rituals that are basically very similar. Whether they're going counterclockwise or clockwise makes a big, big difference. If you're going counterclockwise, this is known as a polar rotation because it actually brings you closer symbolically to the center, to the middle. If you go clockwise, that's actually more of a uh, solar rotation in that it's actually more expansive. I see a lot of Jupiterian symbolism related to solar symbolism too. So our clock, I see a clock right here. There's 12 numbers, right, on the face of the clock. The number 12 is a very, very solar number, the 12 signs of the zodiac, right? Um, and the hands go clockwise. That's a solar rotation, right? But the clock can't work, those hands can't work without that point of pivot. That point of pivot actually means so much more than what people realize. We almost just, we don't, we don't think about this kind of stuff, right? And so they go to the Kaaba counterclockwise. This is what the fixed stars do. The fixed stars go counterclockwise around the pole star, right? So symbolically, it's more of a polar rotation. And so these older cults, that have circumambulation rituals that are more polar in nature, um, they were more concerned with the stellar, uh, with the fixed stars, excuse me. And so the fixed stars were actually more important to them. So just to kind of speak about it more broadly, I think that we've gone through three major symbolic ages, that we live in a solar age. I believe before the solar age, there was a polar age, excuse me, a lunar age. And then previous to that was the polar age. So we've gone through this huge shift from polar symbolism to solar symbolism. The pole is the spiritual pole. It's the central axis in everything. We can all agree that something is spinning here. You pay attention to the stars. From my personal perspective, all of the stars spin around the pole star, right? That is the spiritual pole, right? They are symbolically mirroring that spiritual pole. They still have a spiritual pole. You go to Jerusalem, that's a spiritual pull for people, right? This is their pilgrimage. All pilgrimage locations are spiritual pulls. This was what people just used to do. It used to be a sacred mountain. It used to be a tree. It used to be a temple. It used to be a standing stone. It used to be a rock. In this case, it just happens to be a cube. And the spiritual dynamic is that wherever your spiritual pull is, they believed that this is the point in which heaven and earth were connected. They believe that this is the point that they would consider their stairway to heaven. But they're just emulating an ancient blueprint that has something to do more with the northern sky, right? So I wanted to show just a few images related to the scales, related to justice, lady justice, right? Um, what I've read before is that we refer to it as lady justice because women get to judge who they couple with. Women get to choose more than man does who they actually get to procreate with, who they get to start a family with. And that's just the way of everything, in my opinion. That seems to be the case, right? So 
woman is the true guardian of her gateway, basically. And so there is an inherent sort of thing with uh, women being judgmental, mostly about suitors, mostly about partners. Uh, what I've read before, too, is that there are a number of ancient um, peoples where they would literally bring all of the men together, all of the women together. They would have uh, breeding cycles, like an actual time where people were breeding, an actual birthing period, too, and that they, it was all organized. And basically, the men would compete against each other. They would perform different physical feats, and the women on the sidelines would judge the men and would see who they wanted to procreate with, who they actually wanted to have a child with. And so to me, that's pretty interesting. And woman is the real gateway here too, right? And so there's a lot of middle path gateway portal symbolism just with woman in and of herself. So that's one potential dynamic with why it's Lady Justice and not necessarily a man. So here we have the weighing of the souls ritual in ancient Egypt. You'll notice that the scales look like a cross. Very interesting because Libra being opposite Aries, there's so much uh, like Christ symbolism with Aries, right? So he's the lamb of God. He's the sacrificial lamb. Um, the number four relates to Christ, you know, in a million different ways. Um, so I think it's always interesting when I notice that these older scales look like a cross. It's actually very, very deliberate. Um, there's a lot to take away from that. But the whole idea is that your heart was weighed against the feather of ma'at. And so this would be the feather of truth, right? And so if your heart was heavier than a feather, that was not favorable for the afterlife transition. Um, and so if it were lighter than a feather, it is favorable for the afterlife transition. So this gets into, again, a number of myths where your deeds, your consciousness, uh, your soul is weighed before you get to the other side, right? So before you make that transition to the underworld. And so the scales seem to be this thing that, um, you know, is, is a sort of step before you get to these other planes of existence. And the ancient Egyptian people um, pretty much saw the same thing. So there's a million different things you can get into with that whole ritual. Um, so Archangel Michael, St. Michael, is oftentimes seen holding scales. And what do you know? The sword is right there as well. So you're going to see this pairing time and time and time again with scale symbolism and the sword because they are essentially uh, related to each other in so many different ways. And it kind of looks like to me like he's almost between two pillars here too. So I don't know if that's deliberate or not. Um, but once again, that handle, the middle point, is what allows the scales to even function. So it, it's of primary importance. And then uh, I took this picture on my walk this morning at the river, um, and I just saw the teeter-totter, and I'm like, oh, I'm like, well, I mean, you know, it reminds me of scales, basically. It's the same sort of dynamic, um, but it all hinges on what's called the fulcrum, which is the point of pivot. The point of pivot is where it's at with Libra symbolism, the same way I'm trying to emphasize the northern sky with the north star being the point of pivot for all of the fixed stars in the sky, right? This is probably more for people who are interested in like esoteric symbolism and everything else, but um, there's a whole movement of people that are uh, basically, um, they have reverence for what's called Lady Babylon. I've already brought up the Tower of Babel and things like that, but it's always said that she's girt with sword, that she has a sword with her, right? And if you look at Aleister Crowley's version of this card, which is the next slide, um, you'll see that the sword plays an important role in what he calls adjustment, but this is the card that corresponds with Libra right there. And so she is balancing on this sword. So Babylon is girt with a sword. And so I see this as an expression of, of Lady Babylon. Sometimes she's referred to as the whore of Babylon, things like that. Uh, again, I, I just like to know what's out there with all of these different groups and kind of like how they see the world. And I get a lot of value out of that personally. Um, but you see the sword as being the point of pivot itself, right? And she's balancing on the sword. 
but one thing I want to point out real quick, actually, is the fact that it's so subtle and slight in the card of uh, adjustment. Notice her feet there. So her feet taper down into a point. This is, it, it's one of those things, again, where it seems very, very subtle and very, very, um, almost like, a, like not that big of a deal or whatever. But what I found is that there's a whole tradition um, and there's a lot of artwork where that is actually a pretty big deal. The fact that her feet taper down to a point, right? Um, because obviously she would need to have good balance, right? In order to stay upright like that. Um, but it reminds me of uh, ballerinas, right? Uh, being on their tippy toes and spinning around and things like that. Again, going back to balance and all of that kind of stuff. Um, you'll see Mercury or Hermes, some versions of Hermes on his tippy toe all the time you see that because this represents the point of pivot. It represents that singular point in the heavens, in my opinion. Again, the world axis or the axis moon, if people want to look into it. This is uh, the symbol that's often associated uh, with followers of Babylon. It's a seven-pointed star, and you see Babylon within each of the tips of the star itself. And then you see that there's sevens all over the place, right? And then you also see that there's a pretty obvious, like, it's a Vesca Pisces, Pisces, um, yoni shape right there, right? So to me, this implies, uh, you know, a gateway. It implies a portal. I think all this symbolism to me, it's, I see it as Northern symbolism. I see it as polar symbolism personally. Um, but a lot of people um, do not see it that way for the record. <laughs> so, but when you look at older Venus statues, look at the feet, right? So look at the feet of this older Venus statue. And so this is common. If you go to the next slide, you'll see a couple more and it's even more exaggerated. These are like some of the oldest figurines that you can find of the, like, the goddess, right? And look how narrow the feet are, right? I mean, this one, I mean, look at that. It's, just, it's like an arrow, basically. Um, but it has to do with all of the things that I'm saying. This point of pivot, this point of rotation. Um, she symbolically, and, um, you know, I would say that she symbolically is a northern goddess, in my opinion. This axle, this pillar, this column that stretches uh, to all planes above and below. Uh, that is what she symbolically is representing right here. And there's other traditions too where a woman, it's essentially a pole, that they make a pole out of a woman, basically. Once again, the ballerina thing, kind of this point of pivot on the toes. What is she doing here? If you're looking at the deep, deep, deep symbolism, she is basically emulating the spin of the heavens. She's emulating the spin of the cosmos. The whirling dervishes, I don't know if you guys have ever seen those, that's what they're emulating too, right? This spin that gives everything life, right? That gives everything potential. That's what that represents in my estimation. It's really interesting that this card here is basically showing a ballerina and this is the justice card, right? This is the card that corresponds with Libra. So um, it may seem like these things are kind of separate and there's no unifying thing behind, you know, the toes and the spin and the ballerina and the night sky and all this other stuff. But he understood it. This guy, his name is Lon Milo Duquette. He's kind of a big deal in the esoteric world. His drawings, admittedly, are super crude. I don't, I don't really care for his, like, aesthetic style with things. But symbolically, he knows exactly what he's doing. He, he's written a number of books on the tarot and things like that. And so when I saw this, I'm like, oh, that's freaking perfect because this right here the sword again is essentially mirroring the support or the handle of a scale and her leg is mirroring the exact same thing here so that's the symbolic relationship between what's happening here and what's happening over there and how that relates to the scales the checkerboard relating to balance and all these other things as well right you even see in this glyph here these are like glyphs from like different like um, systems but you can even see the glyph from uh, the feather from ancient Egypt this is the feather of Ma'at right there so again I put a lot of stock into this right here this is just a star trail of all of the fixed stars going around a central star I think that this dynamic here um, 
for me personally, it completely unlocked a whole new layer of symbolism. And um, it's something I encourage students to look into that no matter what your interest is uh, symbolically, you can't not learn something of value when you look into why ancient peoples um, put a lot of stock into what's going on here, right? So even I've read too in some books that people that used to have circular homes, like a tent or a hut or something like that, that the central fire was symbolic of that central star, that they had a known correspondence for that, that they looked in the heavens and they saw this dynamic and they said, if that's good enough for the gods, that's good enough for me. So their homes were circular. Oftentimes their villages were circular. Everything was in this concentric ring sort of pattern, right? Going back again to the circumambulation ritual, that's what you're mirroring when people go to Kaaba or they go to one of their pilgrimage locations and they just circle around it. They're, they're mirroring that dynamic that you see right there. Which again, Ursa Major and Minor play a pretty big part in this whole entire dynamic. If you're unaware, Ursa Minor, the handle of it, the tip of the handle of it, that is the pole star, that is Polaris. It's pretty interesting to me that there's seven stars each, right? There's other constellations up here that I uh, value and I think that there's a lot of interesting information related to them. But these two are the big ones. Uh, the Great Bear, the Little Bear, the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper. They've also been referred to as plows. They've been referred to as chariots or um, wanes, Odin's wane. Uh, they've been referred to as phalluses. They've been referred to as piglets. Um, there's all sorts of different things that they've been associated with. So there's like a, a, you know, dozens of correspondences of what they've represented to different cultures over time. Uh, but traditionally, or in today's world, we see them as dippers. We see them as vessels, right? Even in voodoo, they have a central pillar. And they literally call this pillar the navel of the universe, right? Because they understand the symbolism. This is an ancient tradition. So they have this pillar. You can see that there is a spinning dynamic going up it. And they go around this central pillar because they believe that this is the center of the heavens, essentially. And when you create a temple or you create a lodge, you're creating a, a micro of a macro. You're creating a lodge space and you're saying, this is the center of the cosmos. That's what you're trying to imbue on the whole entire space. And so you're trying to get symbolism that actually matches all of that, basically. And so um, it's called a potomaton. So the central pole, right? The, the navel of the universe. That's another common association with this center, with this point of pivot is a navel. This comes from Freemasonry. This is Jacob's Ladder. And you see that the ladder is going towards the central pillar, right? And you'll see that there's seven stars where the opening of heaven is. So as I said before, if you see two pillars, there's an implied middle pillar. They're just showing you the middle pillar here. One is solar, one is lunar, the other one is polar, right? It goes back to this older expression of things. And so it's the central pillar, just like in the Kabbalistic tree, that truly ascends. It goes above and beyond the other two side pillars there. And that ladder is going right there to that threshold to take you to the other side. Um, similar thing here, right? Another Freemasonic illustration, two pillars, but there's an implied central pillar here. And the implied central pillar has an eye, which is a common association with the central pillar, but you'll also notice that the compass right here, so this is a compass, this is a square. It's often said that the compass relates to heaven, the square relates to earth. The compass has a point of pivot. The middle pillar has a point of pivot. This is of supreme importance in, in my world with how I tend to decode things. So let's hit it home. I mean, I think that all of the visuals are really interesting, but I wanted to end with a handful of quotes. I have some images too. Uh, but a few quotes to kind of just round out what I'm saying here. This guy, his name is Jean Chevalier. His symbolic dictionary is like one of the best you can get. It's common and um, I think that his entries are fantastic. But this is under the entry for scales, okay? Not for Libra. When the pans are in balance at the equinoxes, 
the pointer on the scales or the sword, which is identical with it, becomes the symbol of the changeless center, okay? The polar axis, which stands for it, points to the great bear, which in ancient China was called the jade scales. So literally, I said that these two constellations, Ursa Major and Minor, were known as the Big Bear, Little Bear, the Great Bear, Little Bear, the Big Dipper, Little Dipper. But he's saying here that in China, it was actually called the Jade Scales. So instead of just being uh, dippers and vessels, they were seen as scales, as cosmic scales, right? And so if you want to go to the next quote here. Sometimes, however, the two pans of the celestial scales were represented by the great and little bear. Ritual texts of Chinese secret societies add that the scales in the city of willows are magnificent and shine like stars and constellations, of which they are effectively the reflection at the foot of the cosmic axis. So the city of willows is a metaphorical term. You're going to find this all over the place. Shambhala, uh, Agartha, things like that, of these mystical places. Do they exist? D don't they exist? Where do they exist at? According to my research with what I've looked into, the city of Willows, as he just mentioned, it symbolically represents in the center of this axis that connects all that is above with all that is below. That's why it's associated with the changeless center. The North Star is this changeless center. It's known as an imperishable star, right? I thought it was kind of curious. I wanted to see what jade scales looked like in China, and this is one of the things that came up. Kind of looks like a seven to me. It kind of looks like a tilted seven. So maybe this is, uh, you know, just fits right in line with everything that I'm saying here that this is the type of scale perhaps that they actually were referring to when they saw the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper and they saw what I think looks like, you know, pretty much like a number seven. He says, furthermore, the Sanskrit word for scales, Tula, is the same as that for the Holy Land located in the north, that is at the pole. So for those of you guys who are interested in this, I have a whole sheet, by the way, if anyone is interested in these topics, I have a whole sheet with uh, books that I'm referencing and books that I think will help you on your journey. Uh, but the original Holy Land was in the north. This was a common thing that people um, have come to understand. And Jean Chevalier, he understands it as well. And in the next quote, he says something about the city of Willows. In the city of Willows, all is fairly weighed takes on a new special significance if we remember that the city of willows corresponds to the changeless center you know this axis this wheel of heaven dynamic it's like an axle of a great wheel right and uh, the center of a wheel is the most balanced part of a wheel right and so uh, this is where the unification of opposites occurs kind of reminds me again of the supports of a scale right so what I'm saying is that the pole star is the fulcrum in the night sky. It's the point of pivot in the night sky. That's what it's been um, kind of viewed as for a long time. The same way the scales have a fulcrum, a uh, point of pivot. And this comes from Homer. The eternal father hung his golden scales aloft, right? And so... In my opinion, he's referencing these older cosmic scales uh, that exist in the north because it's been said that the northern sky is where the seat or throne of God actually exists. And I think it's curious, in the next slide, um, you'll see a painting by William Blake. I'm not sure if you guys have ever looked into William Blake stuff. His, his mind is incredible. I get a lot of value out of looking at his work. Um, but... It's been said that the Ancient of Days held the scales, kind of like the quote that I just showed you guys. And this is actually the Ancient of Days by William Blake. He's not holding scales, but he's holding a compass. And the compass itself, right, has that point of pivot, has that uh, fulcrum right there. So I see the similarity between the compass and then scale symbolism as well, as I kind of showed you guys with that Masonic illustration, right? But this card to me, this is uh, the last image here. I have this image and then uh, kind of a, just a close-up version of this. This card says it all. So this is called the Tarot of the Third Millennium. This is the Justice card. 
This is the card that corresponds with Libra. And if I haven't said this yet, in my opinion, when you find or when you're studying the tarot and there is a correspondence with a major arcana card with a sign, you are looking at an expression of that sign. So you are essentially, you are looking at an expression of Libra right here, right? And so, um, so I put a lot of stock into that personally, and there's been so many instances where I found that to be the case, that this is true. So this is essentially, you're looking at a visual, another visual representation of Libra. And she sits between two pillars. She represents the middle way. She is girt with sword. She has her sword upright. It's right in the middle. So it is the middle path. If you want to go to the next image there, you'll see that. Excuse me, I should drink some water. <laughs> you'll see that the sword is pointing up to the middle of the beam there. And so the sword is acting as the central support. And that actually makes where the tip of the sword is, that is a keystone. And so the keystone is what exists in a royal arch. So if you look into royal arch Freemasonry, you're going to see a lot of imagery with twin pillars and an arch that spans between those two pillars. Right in the middle is the keystone. The keystone symbolically is the top of this symbolic dome that we live within. Some people have referred to it as a firmament, if you want to look at it that way. And so this is the way out. Sometimes in Freemasonry, you will actually see the keystone removed and that this is, um, this is the, the exit point, basically. This is the stairway to heaven, essentially. Oh. oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a keystone right there, <laughs> totally. Yeah, so this is a common sort of thing. So when you see an arch, symbolically, it's a dome. When you see a dome, symbolically, you can see that it overlays with the arch. And so once again, you have the two pans, one solar, one lunar. What's to make of this central dynamic? My personal opinion, it's polar. It represents the central axis this uh, central pillar in the house of God, if you will. There's a whole entire science behind it, um, but it is um, where balance actually is sort of um, displayed. It, it, it's the most balanced part of a system is the center, including your system, by the way. So I encourage people to get to their center. Uh, you do that by being present, in my opinion. Um, that's how you access other realms, is by going to your sacred center, which is really the Holy of Holies, basically. Um, and I think that'll do it, guys. So once again, symbolicstudies.com if you're interested in my work. And uh, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Hey guys, before we get out of here, I wanted to mention two things. First off, I should let you know that I gave two presentations last year related to this topic. So if you're interested in even more insights, you should absolutely check them out. I'll link them both in the description. The first one is called The Axis of Libra, and the second is called The Axis of Libra Part 2. They're both available on my live tab. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, I have hours of content available on my Patreon and website, which you can access for just five bucks a month. And with all that said, I hope you got something out of this presentation. Until next time.